Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to another episode of Red, Blue, and Brady. I am one of the podcast hosts here, JJ. And I'm Kelly, the other podcast host. And I love when you say that. It's one of my, I love our little, like, I'm JJ, I'm Kelly. It makes me happy every time. Thanks for uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we are here today in the, with, sitting, we are here today sitting down with the Office of Gun Violence Prevention, which is amazing, I think, for everyone at Brady, but for anyone who works in gun violence prevention to hear, because a year ago, we probably couldn't have said we're sitting down with the Office of Gun Violence Prevention yeah. because y'all yet didn't formally exist. <laughs> and we, this is certainly something that people who have been in this movement for decades wouldn't have said 10 years ago, probably, mm-hmm. that they would have. So this is huge. And we're so excited to be able to sit down and talk about kind of the state of play in 2024, what's happening with the office, what's happening with Brady, where are we going? Uh, but maybe the best way to do this, even though I know we're kind of all known to each other and almost all of us are known to the podcast, that's I'm going to stop getting on you eventually. Uh, <laughs> if we could all maybe just kind of introduce ourselves and kind of share, you know, what it is that we, we work on specifically. And so, again, Chris, I think you get home field advantage. Honestly, just... Thank you for that. Honestly, just because while the Brady offices are nice, yeah. we don't have gilding. We have work to do. It's, <laughs> it's a lack yeah. that I feel. Nonprofits need more gilding. Yes. <laughs> well... I'm Chris Brown. I am the president of Brady United Against Gun Violence, and I'm very, I have a lot of good days, some really hard days, and today's a great day to be here with the leaders of the Office of Gun Violence Prevention and with you guys. So thank you. I love a good day. Yes. We have to celebrate, though. Like, I feel like give people their flowers when you can and, like, Mm -hmm. enjoy the good times with good conversations. And so, with that, maybe we can kick it over to you two gentlemen. Who wants to start? You gonna fight? Uh, I'll start. Uh, so Greg Jackson, uh, the one of the deputies for the White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention, also special assistant to the president. Uh, I guess my job here is to uh, help us build out this really uh, historic, transformative effort to address gun violence in our country. And um, we'll talk more about our office as a whole, but yeah. but Rob and I have really been a yin yang, building out this all of government approach and thinking about. The reactive efforts that need to be built out, um, as well as the long-term and short-term proactive efforts. Uh, and so, I'm excited to be here. I've kind of lean deeper into the investments and how we can bring more resources to those who have been impacted by gun violence. And so, excited to build that momentum. Um, Rob, how about you? Uh, so I'm Rob Wilcox. I'm the other special assistant to the president for gun violence prevention and deputy director of this White House office. Uh, and I think we're here to carry out the president's and vice president's vision and commitment uh, because both of them know that this issue is filled with pain, but they know that with that pain comes so much purpose, uh, but it only gets there with policy. And so this office is meant to execute that policy and implement that policy. And so we honestly come to this job every single day with really just one goal in mind, which is saving lives mm-hmm. uh, and using the incredible tools at our disposal in the federal government that have honestly never been used before to do that. And I, I love that you highlighted kind of the pain to purpose mm-hmm. part of this, because I think so many folks have come to gun violence prevention because they've been directly impacted. And I know that that's, a, that's the reality for both of you, unfortunately. And so I'm wondering, as much as you're comfortable, if everyone at the table could share, you know, how you got into this gun violence prevention work, as opposed to like, there's so much other social good things that you could be doing. You're all clearly brilliant, yeah. make a million. Why, why gun violence prevention? Well, I mean, for me, I was someone who was always passionate about politics and government, and I, I was that kid when I was young that. Uh, even though I grew up in the rural Virginia part of my youth, I was watching C-SPAN and <laughs> reading about Martin Luther King and obsessed over the Malcolm X movie and was like, man, there's so much power in people, you know, to make the world a better place. And all I could see was challenges. And I thought, well, if I could get into politics and government, maybe this people power, I could be uh, one of those leaders to help harness that to, to make our country better. Uh, so I started my career really in politics and uh, did two presidential campaigns and a couple Senate campaigns and uh, a handful of congressional campaigns as well uh, and thought that was kind of my calling. It was, you know, kind of helping become a kingmaker, you know, for future yeah. leaders uh, until I was shot in April of 2013 and the bullet that hit me hit two arteries and nearly cost me my life and um, there was just two distinguishing moments. One was how I was treated, you know, in the hospital. Um, you know, when I entered the hospital, I was interrogated by investigators uh, about my role in the crime and I was treated as a suspect, you know, while I was fighting for my life, literally. 
Uh, and so I just, that really stuck with me that no matter what I had done to make this world a better place, you know, in the, in the most urgent moment of my life, uh, I was seen as a, as a potential criminal uh, as opposed to a life to save. Uh, and then the other side of it was when I made it through my surgery, I turned on uh, CNN and um, I was shot three days after the failed Senate uh, background check vote. And I was watching the same leaders that I helped elect, that I believed in, that I was passionate about, uh, that I had devoted most of my life to serving or fighting for, uh, make excuses of how they couldn't take action on this issue and that this wasn't the time and they couldn't find the solution and couldn't come to common ground. Uh, and so I lost, frankly, a lot of faith, you know, in just empowering people to be those leaders and decided that I was going to pivot from uh, electing and fighting for leaders to fighting for this issue. And if those leaders aren't aligned with, with this issue, then, then they're not aligned with me. And so that's where I made that hard pivot from campaign politics to really issue advocacy and issue organizing. Um, and so, yeah, I hadn't turned back, but I spent 10 years in that fight alongside a lot of you here. Uh, it was not easy. I think the first six or seven years, we were just kind of yelling at the wall, you know? <laughs> we're going to talk about that in a minute. Yeah. It's just like how much has changed so quickly. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, but that's what, that's really what got me started. And uh, I'm just, I'm really thankful that that moment of, of trauma um, really has led to now kind of an era of triumph for our movement. And I'm just glad to be a part of that. And, you know, to your point, JJ, about things changing quickly, they also took time. Yes. And yeah. I think about, like, how I got involved, and I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, uh, between a couple housing projects in the 80s and 90s, and there was violence. But my family never thought about themselves as the ones that they thought about us, my brother and I. But I think what brought the issue of guns directly to our family was a cousin across the country in Northern California. And... She was beautiful, inside and out, and uh, my aunt and uncle, Nick and Amanda, had been donating to Brady for years, uh, which is wild to me, but then she was home from winter break from Haverford and volunteering at the local mental health institute hospital, and uh, this individual stopped taking his medicine, and, and he walked in and killed her, and his brother saw the sign and wanted to take action and didn't. And that funeral, I wasn't, I wasn't there, but I went right to the funeral, and, and that moment sticks with me, and I think about it. And I told myself then that I was gonna do what I could to about this issue, and then I went to D.C. right after I graduated college, and I, and I came right to Brady, because that's who was doing incredible work. Uh, but I can tell you in 2001, what I remember, clear as I sit here now, was the article in the Washington Post where the NRA said with the election of George W. Bush, they work out of the West Wing. And we're going to talk about a lot of this in this yeah. podcast, but what I can tell you is 20 years later, they're not working out of the West Wing. It is gun violence survivors and the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. Yeah. And that's amazing. amazing. But there's a, y'all have a plaque. You're there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I, and I think that that's astounding for folks who, as you mentioned, for decades have been working in this, for decades have been seeing people who we've lost, who have been taken from us, and are saying, okay, well, I'm still going to be here. I'm still going to fight. But now we're starting to see that momentum, I think, really ball there and I'm wondering too like for Chris so you don't come to this movement as a survivor right. how, how do you get, get involved with this you know how did what made you decide Brady's going to be the thing gun violence is going to be the thing that you you devote a lot of your professional life to yeah well I think like many people of my generation I remember exactly where I was when Jim Brady was shot on, in the assassination attempt of Ronald Reagan that was a seminal moment in my life and so I think as an American, regardless of where we are, what we do, especially fast forward all of these years later, the reality is most of us feel like we're only a few steps away from potential violence with guns. And so what brought me to this is I worked on the issue of gun violence prevention when I worked on Capitol Hill a long time ago now. I got to meet Jim and Sarah Brady, and I viewed them as most staffers did who would clamor to meet these folks yeah. because they did it with passion and enthusiasm, just like these guys do every single day and what they bring to the roles. But they also had heart and humor, and that's how it is that you get things done over a long period of time, six years and seven votes. To me, that was a testament of great success, like my hero, John Lewis, right? I think of our movement as basically a movement, right? A collective movement for a safer America for all. 
For me, what brought me back was I lived overseas with my family. I have two children, two girls. I lived in Switzerland, where per capita it's the highest gun ownership in all of Europe, and they don't have gun violence like yeah. we have here. The fact of the matter is, you are inspected randomly for how you store guns in Switzerland. Wow. Right? So safe storage is required. And it gave me a different quality of life. Something that I think most Americans don't understand is when you don't live with the pervasive idea that gun violence can happen, especially in the public square or other places, the quality of life, a happiness factor that you have, a safe sense of safety, which we deny our fellow Americans because of the pervasiveness of gun violence, has a material impact on your life. And that was meaningful enough to me that when I moved back to the United States, I thought, this is the issue that I think that I want to spend my time on as an activist, mm -hmm. as an activist, because mm -hmm. I care about my country, I care about its future, and I think if you consider yourself a deeply patriotic American, the only thing you can choose is to be a champion and an advocate for gun violence prevention. So that's why I'm so proud to sit here today. I feel pumped up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Yeah. Music, right? I know. Power, let's go. I know. <laughs> but thank you all for kind of sharing how you got involved. And I know for some people listening to the podcast, they're familiar with you all, but I hope everyone listening has heard that Rob and Greg are the real deal and they are in the White House for you. And so I'm wondering if we could kind of break it down and start from the beginning. What does it mean to have an Office of Gun Violence Prevention in the White House? Some people might be thinking, well, don't we already have Congress? And is it, like, what, what is it? What does it do? What's the purpose? And why was it founded? Uh, look, it's, it's founded because the president has a commitment to this issue, period. And then the president has taken action on this issue since the first day. And you know he's done, he's made more executive action than any president in history. Not just on one type of gun violence, but all of them: domestic violence, community violence, mass shootings, school shootings, firearm suicide. He tried to do as much as he could with the tools that he had. Thanks to this movement, we also passed a law, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, uh, which gave a whole set of new tools and investments. Uh, and so this office is the manifestation of his desire to do every single thing possible to address this crisis. And so he, he, when he hired us, he said, I need you to do four things. This is where Greg and I will tag team, but he said, I need you to you know, implement the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act in my executive actions. So we've had to dig deep into where's the funding going? How's it being prioritized? Are we actually solving this problem? And are we using the tools to ensure that guns aren't getting into the wrong hands and we're holding the gun industry accountable? And the second thing he said, be bold, bring your new ideas. Think of new executive actions. And so we put 80 ideas in play across 16 agencies because his view and vision and that of the vice president is, is that it isn't just a single agency's problem, it's not a single person's problem, it's all of us. And so we've really broken it down so it's not just a Department of Justice, but a Department of Labor, Education, Health and Human Services, um, and each of them are asked a simple question. What can you do for this crisis? And our first week on the job, the Vice President and President convened the, the cabinet. And a third of that meeting was taken up on our issue, Amazing. where they were challenged to bring ideas to the table. And then we were sent to go make sure that we were getting it done. And, and these things are, are showing up in real ways. It's grant programs for, for youth employment that prioritize communities that have suffered violence, that are serving the kids who've been just as impacted, because we know summer youth employment means less violence. It's the Department of Education leaning in and saying, we're gonna talk about secure gun storage. We're gonna encourage principals and give them the tools they need to make sure that we are helping communities do better, because we know safe gun storage saves lives. It means less teen suicide, less accidents, fewer school shootings, fewer thefts. Uh, and so, that, I think, has been some of the big challenges that we've gotten, and it's because this president and vice president believe, to their core, that we have to be doing everything in our power to address the number one killer of kids and youth in this country. But those are just the first two that keep us busy. <laughs> yeah. And, and Greg can talk to the, the next two. Well, the third big charge was how do we expand partnerships at the state and local level? And I think as activists, especially folks who are very active in their cities and in their states, you know, we know those fights in state legislatures or in budget meetings and city council pretty intimately, but it's rare, I think, especially as activists, for us to see the White House play a role in those types of battles. 
And so the president laid out that, hey, we need to help them fight these fights. We know that we're seeing historic momentum across the country, um, whether it's assault weapons ban, different states or 30 states that are investing in community violence intervention for the first time. But how do we get in and help? And so uh, the first thing we did was we pulled together a convening of state legislators to highlight those who are doing outstanding work, especially uh, in states that are a little tougher because of the Democratic makeup or the legislative makeup. And we thought we would have maybe 10, 20 legislators come, but we had uh, over 100 legislators representing 39 states. It was the largest convening in White House history of state legislators of any issue uh, of this administration, but of gun violence, this was the largest they've ever had. Uh, and we packed the room and the energy wasn't somber, it wasn't anger, it was energy and excitement. Mm -hmm. And we saw folks from red states that were like, hey, we're moving forward with victim services. We saw folks in, in blue states that were like, hey, we can do better on safe storage. Uh, and we saw folks in the middle that for the first time saw their role in the fight. And so in that convening, we rolled out our Safer States agenda, which frankly was a collaboration uh, along with so many different organizations throughout the movement of really the best of what they've been fighting for for years, um, whether that's creating offices, uh, fighting for trauma recovery centers, looking at lost or stolen guns, all of the different fights that we as a movement have been fighting for so long, we laid those out as a safer state's agenda and showed that, hey, these are all ideas that the White House supports. These are ways that you can save lives. And guess what? Here's a report card to show where your state is. And many of them are like, whoa, you know, like, <laughs> we thought we were wanted, you know. Yeah. California thought they had it bad. You know, thought they were just going to walk through and, and you know, and, and, no and brag. And no, we were like, oh, no, you got to work on these, right? <laughs> New York, you got to get here. And oh, guess what? Texas is ahead of you in here. And they're like, whoa, Texas? Yes, Texas is ahead in this area. And so um, that was a big eye opening moment. Uh, and on top of all of that, this was when we first started, the vice president closed the event and she challenged them. She said, I know we can do more. I know we can succeed. I know that we can change this. And we need an aggressive fight at the state and local level, just like we're seeing federally. And so of those 39 states, 27 of those states have already advanced, introduced, and some have even passed new legislation from that agenda and directly credited the Safer States agenda, which we know was a collaborative effort across the movement. So we're going to keep building on that, looking at cities, looking at counties, and really showing communities across the country how they can all play a role in making our country safer, as opposed to just waiting for Washington to take action. Um, our last big challenge, which I'm most passionate about, uh, frankly, is improving in services for victims and communities that have been impacted by gun violence. Um, the president saw in Buffalo, in Uvalde, and in, in frankly, all the day-to-day -day gun violence, the letters that, that are mailed to him, he actually reads many of the letters that folks write, um, that we're not doing enough for victims. You know, we're leaving them behind and we're leaving them with hospital bills, we're leaving them with trauma and we're leaving them without hope. And that is fueling this cycle of violence. And we saw in Buffalo and Uvalde where communities that were already struggling with resources and supports um, were totally destroyed by these tragedies. And so um, our team has been building out a 12 agency FEMA style response. We've done a series of listening sessions. We talked with Highland Park last week. We talked with uh, the community in, in Baltimore two weeks before that. And we're hearing from these communities in the aftermath of their tragedies, what could have been done differently, what supports could they have, and how do we improve moving forward? Um, secondly, we're looking at how do we make changes to um, the supports for people who don't get the media, you know, and looking specifically at VOCA. And just recently, we introduced a new proposed rule um, that will expand the usage of VOCA, that will make it more equitable, that will remove some of those barriers that we know are blocking folks from getting the, the resources they need. Uh, and the comment period is open uh, until April 5th, so of 2024. So, uh, <laughs> so we hope that you know folks who have been impacted by this crisis um, will look to that and really weigh in on, you know, is this going far enough? How do we improve the resources for victims and those who have been impacted by gun violence? And, and our office is working really closely with agencies to make sure that we are doing as much as possible to help people recover um, after tragedy. And the one last challenge is, and this is from the Vice President directly, she said that if there's something great that's happening in the country, she wants to know about it. And if we can lift it, we should. Because the best ideas are not always coming from this building. They're coming from communities all over the country. And so we're doing our best to lift things, whether it's the the CBI Leadership Academy at the University of Chicago or PowerCorps, which is using AmeriCorps resources to provide employment opportunities in Philadelphia um, or Detroit, where they have 
uh, folks who My are volunteers. Yeah, <laughs> you, have, you have young folks who are now working with law enforcement and doing some of the civilian back back of the office work to support law enforcement with their urban safety corps. Like these different creative, innovative ways that communities are are working to address this crisis. We're lifting and trying to help um, facilitate the sharing of these ideas because that's what a true all of government, but really a true public health approach is is applying all of these different ideas from different angles uh, and, and knowing that we don't have all the answers, but we're in a place to help lift all of that. And I mean, thank you both so much for everything that you do and also for explaining that because I think what you're really showing is without this office, there's so many resources that people would never get access to. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, you mentioned Boca, if you could, for people who are listening who don't know what that is, like briefly just... Oh, yeah. So, uh, VOCA, the Victims of Crime Act, the, the key piece I'm talking about is it provides uh, federal funding um, for victims of violent crime to be compensated um, after that tragedy by the government. And so for me, when I was shot, I had $22,000 in hospital bills. And thanks to VOCA and, and victims' compensation, I was able to be reimbursed for those bills. Uh, but unfortunately, across the country, so many folks either don't know about these resources, they're either... Um, you know, the, the process is too difficult when you've lost a loved one to fill out paperwork and process receipts and reimbursements is a really heavy toll on top of everything else. Or the bigger problem is that folks are being denied and we've looked very deeply at the law and realized that there's a lot of gray area of what does it mean for you to contribute to that shooting, right? If in the current law, uh, if you jaywalk and get hit by a speeding car, well, did you contribute? Um, or should that car not have been speeding in the first place? And uh, and that's unclear in the current uh, way that the VOCA rule is, is defined. And so we're proposing to clarify what it means to contribute. We also are looking to prohibit the use of previous criminal history to decide whether or not you should be compensated for your, for your victimization. Um, but then lastly, looking at how do we create a clear definition of what it means to be compliant and to work with law enforcement. And so for me personally, when I was shot, I was interrogated while I was in and out of consciousness after being shot and suffered from blood loss. So if I don't answer a few questions during that investigation, it doesn't mean I don't want to help solve the crime. It means maybe I'm fighting for my life. Mm -hmm. And that is still unclear in too many communities and in too many situations. And so this new proposed rule will provide uh, clearer definitions and clearer responsibilities that the state and the overall uh, government should play a larger role in ensuring that uh, everything is being done to solve the crime, but we're not putting pressure on people that are fighting for their lives or just lost a loved one to weigh in in order to be compensated. And that's so important because so much of what I'm hearing is that this is community driven. This is need driven. This is yeah. not, this is how we think in an academic sense. We'll solve a problem, though I'm certain knowing all of you that like there is an academic plan behind it, but that these are these are issues that folks who are impacted have brought and said, these are things I need, these yeah. are things I want yeah. and do. And I think that that's so essential and, and so important and probably makes people feel a lot more comfortable too, accessing those resources, seeing an office function in that way. And I know just from, spoiler alert, Red Balloon Brady, associated with Brady, but I know from working at Brady that that's a lot of how our action it comes from too. It's not necessarily what we think in kind of a highfalutin nonprofit sense, but like what we know people have been asking for. And for Chris, on your end, Brady just celebrated 30 years of the Brady Bill and then 50 years of existence nice. in the month of February. <laughs> and so I'm wondering for, for you, what does it feel like to say, okay, it's been 30 years since the Brady Bill, it's been 50 years since the formation of our nonprofit this is the year we have an Office of Gun Violence Prevention. What does it feel like for you to have this resource now present and to exist? And did you did you think this was going to happen? Well, you I'm know? not going to say no. <laughs> you know, but you know, was this on your your? Do we people still say on the bingo card and like the 2023 bingo card that you thought it was going to happen? Um, well, if I had a wish list, which I did, of <laughs> things that I wanted to have happen, this uh, was probably at the very top, um, and it was for many in the movement who really thought that having an office like this was essential to uh, bring all of government together. I think Rob and Greg in particular as survivors, but also as experts in the area of gun mm -hmm. violence prevention, because this is a complex area. It's very straightforward in the one sense. We have individuals who are being shot 
uh, the number one killer of our kids, right? These are basic facts. Um, the solutions are multifaceted and complex, and we have long thought of it as a particular agency, for example, HHS or CDC. Let's get more funding so that we can, let's get some funding. Gun violence, well, yes, that's very basic, and of yeah. course, this is a top priority to continue for this office. But when you think about the power of the federal government to lead, the many agencies that have a role in potentially advancing gun violence prevention, in assisting victims, as Greg has said, and we hear from many survivors as a survivor-led organization, Jim and Sarah, and we hearkened back when we celebrated our 50th anniversary to Pete Shields, so many others who have come before us, who've made changes. For us, we are looking, though, for catalytic change. And I would say that the Office of Gun Violence Prevention is part of that catalytic change because it's transforming something where we would say, hey, let's make a priority CDC funding since we were zeroed out all this time. Now we say, let's look at every agency of the federal government and see what they can do. And not only that, we understand too that mayors across this country, right? Uh, city councils across this country view gun violence as one of their top priority issues. The impact is local many, many, many times yeah. for everyday gun violence. And the reality is new ideas and assistance that the federal government can provide along the lines that you're saying, Greg, are so integral, so important. And the policy expertise that this office brings for the myriad additional um, rules that are stemming from the executive actions. I mean, this president honestly has done more to combat gun violence than any president in history. So having an office that can do this in this multifaceted way was a top priority and something I hoped and dreamed would happen, but I do think that it's catalytic along with so many other things that we're now seeing happen mm -hmm. at the federal level. And I hope many states will follow suit. Thanks for highlighting that too, the catalytic nature of it, because I know one of the things that happens just by having this office is that it, you continue to have pressure instead of just having it be headline, go away, headline, go away. Now it's the very president and the vice president of the country who have made this a permanent part of their agenda, which is huge. And we're sitting here in March. So the year still, we've got a long way to go. Yeah. So I'm wondering for 2024, what sorts of opportunities do you see? Um, and then what sorts of challenges do you see specifically for gun violence prevention this year? There's a lot. <laughs> um, you know, I just, I want to brag on Rob real quick. Um, we think about opportunities because Rob is, is a, he's a Beethoven uh, <laughs> at, the key, at, the, at the piano at times. Uh, but yesterday, just yesterday, we had a meeting with 12 agencies and in the Roosevelt Room, you know, um, I mean, the president could hear us if he was in the Oval Room. That's the Oval Office. That's how close we were. And Rob facilitated a meeting with um, some of the most senior leadership across these agencies and talk specifically about safe storage and the importance of storing firearms. And we talked with the Department of Defense. We talked with Veterans Affairs. It's already doing this throughout their community. Uh, DOJ that's already rolled out the most comprehensive guide on safe storage. But then we also turned and looked to the Department of Interior and found that they already have a huge campaign in the tribal community that they've already built out, but they hadn't partnered with the Department of Justice before. We looked over to the office of uh, the Department of Agriculture, who knows that farmers are at great risk to suicide by firearm, and now are sitting next to Veterans Affairs and saying, wow, we could use these exact same resources to expand what we're doing. And we saw housing and urban development, a community that's, that's unfortunately often overlooked, seeing that, oh, I have resources in the Department of Justice, here, 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 that can all weigh in. And that type of collaboration has never even happened on a Zoom call. <laughs> um, but here we are in the Roosevelt Room having a discussion about how we can approach an all of government um, effort to shift the culture around how people see responsible gun ownership and really lift the standard. And that was facilitated by Rob, and I, I could have never been more proud uh, <laughs> to work alongside him. And, uh, but I think there's moments like that where we think that we're doing all we can, and maybe one agency is doing a tremendous job. But in all of these efforts, whether it's funding strategies to support communities that have been 
uh, you know, devastated by gun violence, whether it's shifting the culture through awareness, whether it's making sure a policy is being fully implemented, there is a ton of opportunity, even from just pulling together different agencies to zero in on this. And that's what we did with COVID-19, and you saw how we were able to drastically turn around uh, which, what was the largest health crisis of many of our lifetimes. Um, but in America, and the president says this himself, you know, we have a history of going through crisis and coming out stronger. And that's because of the power and the will of the American people, um, but also the collaboration and leadership of the White House. And our biggest opportunity in this moment is to bring together all of these agencies to fight for these big areas and these big opportunities to shift culture, to shift policy, but also bring resources to those who are most in need. Uh, and I'm sure Rob has some more concrete things, but I had to just brag for him because I'm sure he wouldn't should. do it. Yeah. As, we, as we said, this is a time for like celebration of flowers mm -hmm. and acknowledging <laughs> that, you know, that this is, this is a hugely important thing and that you don't have to question it <laughs> if we need to be so bold. So how about you, Rob? Anything here in the coming year? Uh, I mean, look, we know that we have seen rates of gun violence that were both unaccepted and unexceptionally high. Uh, and we have seen a president who's leaned in to kind of pull all the levers he can pull. And, and what we've finally seen is some of this gun violence go down, but not nearly enough. And so I think what I'm looking forward to is doubling down. And I think we can accelerate the investment. We can accelerate taking on irresponsible actors in the gun industry. We can accelerate strengthening our background checks. Uh, and I think about it just a few things. You know, just a few weeks ago, for the first time ever, the president, in a message to the country, named Community Violence Awareness Week. And that was thanks to Greg Jackson, who proposed it. And the president said yes. And then we spent a week focusing on the solutions to community violence, raising awareness of the issue, rethinking it, reframing it, uh, and committing ourselves to addressing it. And so we brought together state legislators. We had the first ever convening with nearly a thousand leaders across the country to talk about funding opportunities, not just at one agency, but across three. We went to Philadelphia to see how the work was happening on the ground. And we had this incredible graduation with 31 of the, really, the brightest stars in the community violence intervention field who got to spend their graduation with the vice president and the governor of Maryland and Greg and myself. And it was beautiful. And they walked out fired up, but they're going to go do the most incredible work. And so that inspires me that this summer we're going to have less gun violence than we've had since before COVID. It inspires me that I think about the Brady background checks in 30 years, how much work we've just done in the past couple years and how much we'll be able to do. Uh, we're in the process of finalizing a regulation that could effectively close the gun show loophole, close the online sales loophole, things that Chris and Brady have been working on for years. I mean, Jim and Sarah Brady, and I, I worked at Brady in 2001 and again in 2013, we've been trying to close that for a long time. And we've come up short a number of times. In, in 2000, after that horrible shooting at the Columbine High School, there was a bipartisan bill that came to the floor and it got 50 votes in the Senate with Al Gore casting a tie-breaking vote and it fails in the House. And honestly, it was a dark period for the gun safety movement for years. The gun industry got more protections than ever before. We didn't invest in solutions and we are living with the consequences of the NRA writing our gun laws. And in 2013, when we saw another tragic shooting, there was another bill that sought to take on this gun show loophole, this online sales loophole to expand the Brady background checks that we know work. And again, it fails. It only has 50 Democrats to vote for it and four Republicans. Uh, and then 10 years later, in 2022, we see another horrible shooting at a school and a terrible shooting in Buffalo. And this time, we go back to that negotiating table with more momentum than we've ever had before, with more movement power, with more ideas. Because yeah. we didn't just go and say, let's get background checks. We said, let's go in and get funding for red flag implementation. Let's go in and make an enhanced background check. Let's fund community violence intervention. Let's make the largest commitment to youth mental health in history. And instead of failing, we succeeded. But it wasn't just that we had 50 Democrats, which we did again, but we had 15 Republicans show up. And when the NRA said no, the Senator said yes. And now we get to implement that law and we are about to implement some of these pieces that will take the Brady background checks to places they've never seen, right? Getting at people who are offering guns for sale at gun shows. 
or online ads, right? The source of so many of the traffic guns. And this enhanced background check is like Brady background check 2.0. I mean, we instead of just looking at the database, we're calling into states looking for information. And so we're doing this for 18, 19, 20 year olds. And do you know what we found? Is since we've implemented this, we've increased the denials for that population by 25%. And the stories are life saving. There was one individual who tried to buy a gun at a gun store. It had to be a, a long gun or shotgun, so like an AR-15. And the Brady background check said go. But when they called in with this enhanced check, what they found is they had been committed to a mental institution just a few weeks prior. A person who was literally just in crisis. So instead of a yes, it was a no. And so instead of a tragedy, it's potentially a life saved. And like this, to me, is what's exciting, is we are focusing on the real problems. Community violence, suicide, threats to our schools, threats in the intimate partner setting, and we are applying all the solutions. So I am like filled with optimism, yeah. because for all the heartbreak that we share in this movement, it is the hope and possibility of saving lives that keeps us going. So I cannot wait to come to work tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that, because that is the privilege the president gives us and this entire movement is the chance to work on this issue every single day because that's what we know it deserves. Well, your hope is infectious. I, I was feel it. Say, I yeah. feel it. And I think. Uh, oh, no, I, just, I wanted to add something too. I mean, even beyond introducing new solutions and implementing new developments, one of the most powerful things of this office existing is that we're able to connect those who have been impacted with the real government resources that exist. And so I just think about the last two weeks. You know, um, we all know about Uvalde and how challenging and tragic that was. And many of us know folks who were there, or families or survivors. And I've heard multiple times from mothers and families how difficult the process to get support um, was for them. So we were able to put them on a call with the director of the DOJ Office of Victims of Crime. And they laid out all of their challenges, and now there's a chance for them to talk through and help refine things. You know, we, we we're rolling out funding for 14,000 school-based mental health professionals as a result of the Bipartisan Safety Communities Act. Uh, but when we looked at the first round of folks who applied, there were clear gaps. And one of the gaps was that there wasn't enough HBCUs at the table. Mm -hmm. 264 awards, only two HBCUs. But just yesterday, we brought together 12 HBCUs, and the, the morning that the actual funding for the second round was announced, 8 a.m. it was announced, 11 a.m., 12 HBCUs were being briefed on these resources. And we found that in Morgan State, they're already doing the work in Baltimore schools. In Howard, Howard University, they're already building out uh, mental health strategies to help. And they even have a mobile crisis center that they're about to launch. So we're seeing that we're connecting the real people who are impacted with the resources that exist. And that watchful eye and us being that bridge um, I think might be the most powerful part of this is that there's already so much the government can offer, um, but for too long the communities and the activists and the leaders, we have been uh, trying to figure it out on our own. And now you have a team here that is getting the biggest crash course of possible on what exists out there and then are empowered, not just encouraged, empowered to connect those communities with what's possible in the government. And so. We're just so excited to do that. We have four events this week. I mean, every week, I think we promise set a record for how many people we bring in this building. <laughs> uh, because we always have a herd of folks here, like, because we want to make sure that we are being that bridge and facilitator of how do we get the communities that, and the individuals who have been overlooked, um, not just in the room, but like at the table, getting the resources and helping to shift uh, and, and, and impact the decisions that are made here. And that's, I was going to say, that's what's so beautiful about the office. I, you mentioned the CVI week, and those are communities that are often suffering from the, they're being disenfranchised, they're being oppressed, they're being hurt in all these ways. And for the White House to go out and say, you're coming in here, and you're going to have a seat at the table is incredibly powerful, especially in an era when so many people are cynical about government and about democracy and it's, now the office of the presidency and the vice presidency is going to some of the most impacted communities and saying, come here, we want to hear from you, we want to help you. That's so beautiful. I mean, one quick story on that. We had a call with, there were 28 teens that were shot in a mass shooting in Baltimore. And it didn't get the media, didn't get the press. We did a listening session and there were mothers there that talked about how teens were shot on their front porch. 
and were there for hours trying to get help and they had to come back so that was their home you know that was their home and they were in public housing and had housing assistance uh, one person said that her, her son wouldn't come home for a month because he was just too afraid, terrified. And they were telling these stories, bawling. And they said, you guys got to work on your city services. And I said, wait, ma'am, this is not the city. This is the senior leadership for housing and urban development for the country that mm-hmm. you're talking to. Mm-hmm. So we're not just helping. We're just not focused on changing your condition. You're informing how we look at this issue from housing and urban development forever. And that is the small example of how these gaps, these bridges that we're building are not just helping individuals, it's really shifting the entire culture of how government responds and thinks about addressing this issue. But I want to say, I mean, to Greg's point, going from this, what we can do federally to what the challenge that I think we have is, it shouldn't just be this energy coming from the White House. Yeah. We need it in governor's mansions, we need it in city halls, we need it everywhere, because for too long this issue was just in a single lane. But what we know to address the public health crisis is you have to do it all. And so we need offices in all of these places, but they can't just be tucked away. I think some of the magic in this office is where the president and vice president demand it be placed, which is one step below them. We are literally one person away from the president when we need help, we need action, and when we are briefing. And that gives us tremendous ability to actually make this change. So that is essential. And then you got to get the right people, the people who understand this issue, to understand this pain, but also the promise of the policy. And you got to give them the mandate to do it all. And like that is what we need, right? Because it can't just be a White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention. We need a Maryland Office of Gun Violence Prevention, and I know our friend Governor Moore is working on that, but we also need local offices of violence prevention. That is the ecosystem mm-hmm. this issue deserves so that we actually can tackle this in all its forms. And so as we are working to build this, I think we need everyone's help yeah. to yeah. put this in place everywhere so that we can make sure we're safe in lives. Well, and I think that that leads to kind of a, a great, maybe even final question for us to start segueing into, because the danger with this, of course, is I know you're all very busy people, but Kelly and I will trap you forever. <laughs> and you've got, you've got lives to save, so you can't just talk to us forever. Although, we would like it. We would take it. <laughs> But I, you know, so obviously your advocacy efforts, not new, right? Your advocacy efforts of Brady, it's not a new thing. What the office has accomplished in its short time is amazing, right? You guys hit the ground running and have been like sprinting in a, in a marathon. Although I was thinking earlier really we were describing it, it's almost like before gun violence, everyone was kind of running in a race together, but not touching. Now we've all kind of linked hands, which is a beautiful yet terrifying image, right? You don't want to get in your way our way as we get to that finish line. But I'm wondering, you know, what can listeners who are out out there in the world, what can they be thinking about doing? What is something that they can do actionable in the next year, in 2024 specifically, that could help move the needle, could help make their community safer, could help make their families safer in many ways? Is it advocating, as you've said, for, you know, we need all of these offices. So is it, are you calling your mayor? Are you calling your governor? What, what is it that they can be doing? And what, um, on kind of maybe on the advocacy game for Brady, are you really excited about seeing move, Chris? Well, I think the answer always is do all the things. Yeah. I, mean, the, the, I think the point that was made around the, um, of, first of all, the fact that they're one person away, Greg and Rob and Steph Feldman, one person away from the president and the vice president is super important when we think about their power to actually bring people together, to convene not only folks who may be heads of agencies, but also the impact on victims of gun violence, to be able to come in and have that audience with these senior leaders where a lot of victims have felt denied that. So I guess the first thing that I think is really important as advocates, as activists, if we're thinking about our Brady chapters is spread the good news. Because in a lot of ways, the enemy of the gun violence prevention movement is not always the folks on the other side, what I would say second amendment extremists, right? We're not against gun owners, right? Um, We have many gun owners who are part of this. It's hopelessness. So make sure that you understand how important this office is, the gains that we're making across this country. And then take action around what I always talk about is your sphere of influence. We all have that, Mm -hmm. right? 
And the ability to be able to think about the kinds of things this officer is doing, think about where you live, think about the people who have some role to play in reducing gun violence in your neighborhood, in your community, and get engaged with them. Get engaged in your community with others who may be a part of your civic association, if you're a parent, your PTA. Engage in discussions with your school systems around safe storage. We have a whole now proposal and approach coming from the White House (laughs) about what that should look like. But ultimately, it's us as citizens who can engage our elected officials at the local and state level to ask, what are you doing to combat gun violence? And have you thought about not only all of the things that you can do from a policy standpoint, but also enforcement. A policy means nothing if we don't come together and help ensure that that policy is enforced. And then engage, make sure that as individuals, we're supporting the people who represent us who are going to become and are gun violence prevention champions. All of those things are super important. That's how we're here, that's how we get the catalytic change, and that's how we look five, 10, 15, 20 years from now, hopefully even shorter back, and say, we solved this public health crisis. Let's move on to the next hard thing. That's our goal. Yeah, I mean, that's beautiful. And I think, before we come to you, like I even think of just, I think my experience has been so different because I only came into the gun violence prevention movement about four and a half years ago. Kelly, you've been in it for quite a while longer, I think. How long? Eight. About eight, eight years. That's not a short it's like time has no meaning for me anymore. <laughs> but I think it's one of those things where I've seen such a culture change in the way that people are talking about gun violence and even my short time at Brady from yeah. people who yeah. early That's conversations true. were so hard and I would be struggling and people in the office who had been working on it for 8, 10, 15 years would say, oh, you should have seen it 15 years ago. I couldn't get a meeting. This is amazing now. And I feel like even in the last year, we've been on a roller coaster yeah. of folks are really... Even if, they, even if folks aren't necessarily engaged, they want to know. Right. And I think that a lot of that probably we can we can credit to some of the culture change work that Brady's doing, but also to the incredible work that your, your office is doing. So what are things that people can be doing right now that could help you out? Oh, I, I don't think it's about helping us out as much as we're here to serve the people of this country and fulfill the president's wish to end gun violence in our time. Um, I will say that I think a lot of what we're doing needs people to take action. So uh, the secure storage piece that that Chris just mentioned, I mean, in some ways that was both the ground up and now it's a a spread out, right? I think so many Brady volunteers and Moms of Men Action volunteers really thought up this idea in the first place of going to schools and saying, why don't we talk more about secure storage? I know my my aunt and uncle who are my heroes, Nick and Amanda, they did a lot of that work in California alongside Sheikha Hamilton. that then boils up to the US Department of Education saying we should all do this. But now it goes back down, and it's up to the schools yet again to pick up that mantle and people in those districts to say, why are we doing this? And not just how we raise awareness, but how do we make devices, secure storage devices, accessible? Yeah. Right? And so there's always going to be more to do locally to, to take what we're doing and run with it. And when we're talking about these grant programs that we think can be so impactful, we can talk about them, we can release them, we can promote them, but it takes people to, to say, hey, are we applying to them? Hey, Mayor, have we thought of our comprehensive plan? Do we have an office? Uh, and so I, I would hope that you know, we are serving people, number one, but number two, the things that we're putting out, they should just pick up and run with, because hopefully all these pieces are things that we end up doing together, because that's the only way we solve this. I think you said it earlier, right? It's never going to be a top-down approach. This is how we do it. But what we can do is make tools and resources available for people to design the strategies that work to heal their communities. So, so I think that that's what I would say. And but it, it's not anything that they have to do for us. Uh, they certainly not. I think we're we're here to serve them. Yeah, I, I'll just add. I mean, I think we also we really need everyone to lean in on the solutions. I think we talk so much about the problem of gun violence, how bad it is and how unsafe it is and where you can't go to school or you can't go to a parade or you can't go to church, but we don't spend enough time talking about the solutions and what's working. Mm -hmm. And we think about, oh, it's not safe in my neighborhood. Well, how do I protect my home versus how do I get out there and help my neighborhood become a safer place? Um, and, and, and that's one thing that our office is completely focused on is like how do we advance as many solutions as possible 
But if we can get everyone who's concerned about this issue to get into a solutions-oriented mindset, um, it will make a major difference. And um, we always talk about how you know hurt people hurt people, and and our our mantra mantra is more the heal people heal people. So how can we figure out how to heal as many folks as possible, knowing that that spread um, will have a huge impact? And I I put on my phone because there's a quote from Martin Luther King that I always hang on to. It's that. Um, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And we are really fighting against darkness at the end of the day. Um, This is the most traumatic and unfortunately in so many moments, some of the most heinous uh, tragedies that we're witnessing uh, on this planet. And we have to figure out how do we bring light into this and get to those who are in crisis, get to the youth that are that are scared, that are fearful, that are lashing out, get to those who are afraid to move in the world and maybe want to end themselves. Like, how do we get light to those who are most in need, um, knowing that that's the real battle that we're fighting? You know, um, we joke, we don't talk about the NRA anymore. I mean, they're bankrupt and their leader is going to, you know, just lost his case. The real battle is how do we help shift the American mindset from a place of fear and despair to hope, um, and love because that's that's what we have to accomplish and all of this policy i think is a part of how we get there but that internal uh shift um can start with us because we've seen the worst of it and for us to still be hopeful um i think is a very courageous thing completely agree i was just going to say i feel like the theme emerging from what you shared and what you shared is just like you were saying sometimes we think that the enemy or not the enemy but the opposition is someone else and really it's our own attitude and our own posture of like we can do this we can do this we can actually live in a country that's a lot safer so really appreciate that i do think that one of the things that's related to the point you make is how we think about change in this country and there's a quote that i'm going to completely mangle but i will attempt it anyway that change is slow and slow and slow and then it happens all at once Right? And I think about that as we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Brady, knowing that Jim and Sarah took six years and seven votes to get the law passed, that in that time, 30 years later, 4.9 million uh, sales had, uh, two prohibited purchasers have been stopped, and that there are people walking around alive today because of that law, and not a small number at all. And so while it may be that sometimes a year or two or three goes by where we're toiling Mm -hmm. in what feels like the salt mines, there's a reason for it. And there's a purpose behind that. All of us sitting here today really stand on the shoulders of others who came before us who said, enough. And in my small way, even if I don't know that tomorrow something monumental can happen, I'm going to howl into what can feel like a hurricane, but it still is something that I must do. And if every American could be so inspired, we would, we'd be done with this. And that, I think, is very compelling to me when I think about yeah. why what you're saying is so important, which is, and you, your point, Kelly, which is the hope is in each of us. Mm-hmm. We carry that, and the light is there. And that's what guides what we do every single day. And so I I like thinking about dwelling on that as sort of a final thought. Man, this was a very, I'm going to like, this is when I bottle. This is one of like the episodes that I think I'm going to come back to when I need inspiration. Because I think that that's such a big, important note maybe to leave on for our listeners. A lot of folks who who listen to us are folks who work in gun violence prevention, whose names, unfortunately, I will never know. Right? Because in their community, Every day they're getting up to do gun violence prevention work, but they're never going to be on a national stage. They work for maybe like a, a, a small organization. They're doing the work by themselves. Or when they come, they're like, they're working with Brady, but we don't get to see them. You know, it's that kind of thing. But they're part of this office. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that means they're in these rooms. And so they are talking to the president. They're there. And I think that that's a really, really beautiful thing to hold on to. So 
Thanks so much to all three of you. Thank you to you two in the office for hosting us in a, in a beautiful room with yes. very inspiring, beautiful mm -hmm. people. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. some design ideas. There yes. you go. Yes. <laughs> or leather. <laughs> and gold. More, yes. more gold. Yeah. More gold. Yes. <laughs>